Hi, I'm your host Jürgen Strauss from Innova Biz and I'm really excited today to welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast all the way from Jacksonville in Florida, the USA, Sherry Clark, who's the founder and CEO of the Storehouse Media Group, an award-winning book publishing company. Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, Sherry. It's a great privilege to have you as my guest. Oh, thank you for having me here, Jürgen. I am so excited about this and I think it's quite a privilege to be here. Well, thank you. Now, your company, Stonehouse Media, work with aspiring authors to write their book for them, uh, to coach them to write their own book, to edit their book, to publish it, to market it up all the way to a bestseller, and also to get the media interviews, which is part of that uh, marketing, I would imagine. Um, so I'm really excited to dig into all of those things, everything around writing a book and publishing a book and promoting a book. Uh, but before we start talking about all those things, what's the impact you're having in the world, Sherry? Well, you know, I, I look at it that I help people realize their dreams. And that, you know, I get people that come to me and they have powerful stories and powerful messages. And through those and through a book, they literally impact lives and they mm. impact cultures. So, you know, as being part of Storehouse Media Group, you know, it, it's it's like a real honor to be part of that process. So it's, it's like a rippling effect. You help them realize their dreams and then they turn around and help others realize dreams are even bigger. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love businesses that have that approach of I can make a difference to one person, help them realize their dreams, help them transform their lives and make an impact. But then they make an impact with other people and, and it's a big kind of, as you say, the ripple effect. Yes, yes, yes. It's, it's very exciting. Hmm. Okay, well, um, book writing and book publishing. So let's start with the kind of obvious question. Why should someone write a book? Wow, it is, writing a book is one of the most powerful marketing tools for one thing. So if you are looking to increase your credibility, uh, establish immediate authority to become the go-to expert, authoring a book is going to get you there because people will check you out like, oh, they've written a book, cool. So getting into that, that place of authoring a book and showing your expertise. Maybe people don't know what you're doing, but they're gonna know during that book. And also I've known people who just simply wanna write a book to leave a legacy. And um, a really good story mm -hmm. of this, uh, one of my authors had written a book along that line and some younger young guy had come to him and said, I just want you to know what happened. I read your book and I was so excited. And I went to my dad and I said, dad, can you write our family story. I've never heard it. I don't know all the pieces. And his dad did. And then not long after he died, I mean, like really, I mean, soon after he published his book, he died. But his family mm. had that legacy that the man left behind. And it was, it was very touching that something like that, I mean, that was a profound effect on that family. Whether or not it ever yeah. went out to the marketplace, they had that piece of their dad, the husband, the son left over through that book. And some people, they just want to tell a powerful story. And what happens when they tell that powerful story, it really does catapult them to be an expert in that area. Uh, people will come to me like, oh, I want to write a business book and we're good. We'll start writing that business book. But then they find out that they have this powerful journey that they want to share with people. These are entrepreneurs and CEOs and leaders and innovators and through their story, people are able to resonate with their story because it shows everything. Mm. It shows the good, the bad, and the ugly. And they're yeah. able to then take that and, and resonate and then and empowers the readers. Like if that person can do it, so can I. So it's just mm. a book is just a good thing all the way around. Mm. Yeah, I love those stories. And of course, you know, you, meant, you talk about story that um, – somebody starting off writing a, a business book which is perhaps very factual and perhaps very analytical 
Uh, and and at some point they discover, hey, there's a story behind that. How mm. I got here, how how we develop this this analytical thing or this business philosophy that we're talking about here, and and so they use the story. And story, of course, is a very powerful connector. Um, people emotionally connect to story. So as you say, that's um, that's something that might help other people say, well, maybe I can do that. Absolutely, I I love storytelling. Uh, it is the most powerful form of communication. If I'm sitting here just giving you statistics and dates and just data, you may remember some of it. But if I put it to a story, you're going to remember it. By the time we leave, you're going to remember more of what I said. It's going to be more impactful because it will connect a lot of times on the emotional level. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, speaking of stories, how did how did you get started in, in this business of book publishing? <laughs> well, you know, it was never on my bucket list. So I was a copywriter and I was a content writer. And a friend of mine came to me and he said, hey, you know, the, this college is offering these, these courses on writing a book. Why don't you take some? And I thought, well, why not? I never thought about it, but sure. So I started getting really interested. I took all these courses. I read everything I could get my hands on about writing a book, about how to edit a book, about different kinds of publishing and what's involved. And I mean, I was really into it because Jurgen, I was going to write the next great American novel. But, <laughs> you know, life doesn't always go down that road you want them to go down on. So I became a foster mom and spending my time in the foster uh, care system was not was not as uh, what I expected. It was jarring. It was eye opening, and I was really I really wanted to to tell people, make them aware of what was going on. I, I wanted mm. to sound the alarm. The only way I could was as a writer. So I decided to write a book. So I'm pounding away on my book, and one of my clients comes to me and he says, "Hey, I've got a client who's written a book. Would you mind editing it?" And I'm like. Holy cow. Uh, yeah, sure. I'll edit her book. And I did. And I found that I had a knack for it, that I loved it. And I started getting a lot of uh, referrals, word of mouth referrals. And then I published my book, Small Voices Silenced, about the foster care system. It was my memoir, my experience and journey. And it got published and it won some awards and now I'm getting more clients. So again, writing a book is going to increase that credibility mm. and put you there as an expert. So I'm, I'm getting more clients and now I have the problem of them saying, what do I do now? I've written a book. How do I get it published? I'm like, wow, good question. And I didn't want to refer them to my publisher because there were some things I, I wasn't happy with. And so I started taking pieces from what I had learned and started doing some more research and I started pulling it together and I was publishing books. Then people wanted me to write their books and then, hey, no one's buying my book. How do I get people to buy it? So then that got me into the whole thing about marketing books. And then I created my own bestseller program from pieces of here and there. And it's just always, every time I've ever used it, it works. And so I decided, Okay, I'm going to make a company. So I created Storehouse Media Group. You know, basically it was a situation, as my mama used to say, find a need and fill it. Find a void and fill it. And I had voids. And so I'm doing <laughs> Storehouse Media Group and we're going along and, you know, we're, we keep adding services as we go along. Uh, if we know it's a good thing for the, the client, if we hear them say, I need this, oh, I need that, can you help me? I go on a, you know, I go on the hunt to find ways how we can fulfill those needs for our author. Mm. Yeah, that's a fabulous story, and it, it kind of all started as you said with your own book. And and what I really like is that you were open to so many other possibilities. So it wasn't just your expertise and your experience that you went through in the with the foster care system, which is what your book was about it wasn't just that that people came to you with for help it was the whole process and and then like starting off with the promote well editing and then uh production of books um publishing the book and and then the promotion of the book 
Yes. Yes. It was just, it, it was just like one step to the other, not any mm. of it planned, but it just, it just happened. And I look all of it. I mean, I, I wouldn't have even known what to do if somebody brought this to me, you know, I don't know, 30 years ago, I would, I, it would have blown my mind, but it was, you know, you have to be open to explore new possibilities. And when somebody comes to you and they have a need, you know, either fill it or find someone who can. And I think that clients respect that. Even if you say, I can't do it, but let me refer somebody who can. Chances mm. are they're going to come back to you. You're not losing a client. You're really gaining their trust when you do that. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's it's about caring for the client rather first rather than yes. how can I how can I get business out of this first? Right, right, mm. right. All right. Now, um, what? So you built Stonehouse Media Group, and you talked about all the things you kind of added to the services of of the group. Um, what makes that group different to say other publishers or other other companies that write your book or edit your book and publish? Uh, we do a lot of things that are different. And uh, I, you know, I didn't grow up in that world. So I, d I came with no preconceived notions. Hmm. So storehouse media is, it's a one-stop shop because I've literally done all of it, like every step I've done in some way or fashion. So I'm very familiar with every step of the, of the process. And, you know, when you own a business and you have a team, it's always good that you know everything that goes on because I think you become a better leader when you do that. Uh, so we do everything in excellence. And I know that a lot of places say they do everything in excellence and they're, they're probably telling the truth. But we really do. We don't approach anything as a cookie cutter. We have everything's customized, everything's individualized with our company. And the client is treated with respect. They're treated with courtesy. We listen, really listen to what they want and what they need. And then we follow through with it. Uh, they know that we're with them 100% of the way. We're walking that journey with them. And over the years, I have developed, I have added a wonderful team. I mean, they are amazing. They're passionate. They got mad skills like nobody's business. But I had to kiss a lot of frogs to find them. I'm telling you. And now <laughs> I've got my gems there. And I'm holding yeah. on to them because they're really, really good. And everyone on my team, they are passionate. They treat every book we work with as if it was their own book. And I like that. I would not be able to work with somebody who didn't have that passion. You know, I can always teach skills. I cannot teach you passion. So mm -hmm. we make sure that the, the client has a wonderful experience. They walk away with a book they're really proud of. And that's one thing. But another thing that makes us different is our publishing services. Compared to other self-publishers or hybrid publishers, they take a piece of the pie of everything. So if you, if they publish your book for them, they'll put your book in, I call it a library, but in their publishing account. And for managing your book, they take a part of your royalties earned. So some take 40, some take 50%. Uh, we don't. When you come to us, you become the, the publisher and you get 100% of your royalties. We don't take a dime of it. And we still, we're still walking with you every step of the way here to get you to that point. So it's not like we just turn things over with you. It's a very easy transition. Authors love it. Another thing is when you're with a publisher and they have your book in their library, if you wanna buy book copies, say you're, you're going to speak somewhere and you need 500 copies of your book, um, you have to go through your publisher and they've got administrative and they got, you know, handling charges and stuff like that. You order your books directly from the printer. So you buy everything at wholesale. And sometimes you can save like $10 a book. So think mm. of those numbers. If you're ordering 500 books and you're saving $10 a book, that's quite a savings. 
Mm. And uh, also you can go in there and you can look at your royalty reports, you know, how many books have you sold, how many you're selling, you know, kind of get an idea of where they're being sold. So you really become like the captain of your ship. And again, we're there. We're just doing all the heavy lifting for you. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a really unique model all around. Um, there's a couple of things that came up for me there as you were speaking. And one of the things you said was building a team and um, hiring for people who are really passionate about, I guess, well, I'll ask, I'm, I'm guessing you mean passionate about the work that they're doing and also passionate about helping clients succeed. So tell us a little bit more about how, how do you build a team culture? Because obviously you started on your own, you built the company, started from scratch, started hiring people, and now you've grown. Um, how, how did you intentionally create that culture that, that has that philosophy of we're really driven to help people succeed with their books and, and use this different model that you've built? Yeah, well, the first person I took on was actually somebody I had worked with before and I knew her for years and I knew her, I knew her character. And mm. so I brought her on actually to be my administrative assistant. It didn't work out that way. That girl is a mad researcher. I mean, she can research. I tell people she can find a flea, a dead flea at the bottom of a pile of ashes. She is <laughs> that good. And so I started seeing like, She's, she's good administrative, but man, I'm going to let her loose in what she does best and what she loves doing and what she enjoys so she can shine. So I ended up getting a researcher thinking I was getting an administrative person. And that's fine because I needed a researcher. You need a researcher in this business. And so it was her and I, and I relied on her so much. And so the 80, 20 rule, you know, where you look at everything and there's the, the rule that 20% of something does, uh, 80% of, 20% of something brings in 80% of the results, right? So if you're a church, 20% of your congregation gives 80% of the money or the tithe. If you have a sales team, 20% of your team produces 80% of your sales and on and on. It's really an interesting philosophy. So I started doing that with my business. And as I'm doing it, I'm publishing but I realized my passion, everything that I enjoyed that was beneficial in a lot of ways was my editing, was the ghostwriting, was getting into the marketing. And so we went on this hunt for somebody to help us with the publishing. And that took some time. That took a lot of time to find it. But when we did, man, it just landed. I knew when I talked to her, I heard the passion. I worked with her on a few projects and I could see, you know, like she had that spirit of excellence to her. She wasn't going to settle for good enough. And we've been working together for years. And now she's like, she runs the whole publishing, you know, division. I mean, I overlook everything, but I know her. I trust her. We've worked on so many books. I know her ways. So we, we've done that. And then I needed editing. And so, you know, I, I, this woman came to me referred and I started watching her work and I'm like, wow, she's really good. So it was just, you know, it was like, you know, just adding and adding and trying people out a little bit. And then once they proved that they did and your attitude, I look at their attitude just mm. as much as I do their skills. Like I said, I can yeah. teach you skills. I can't teach you passion and I can't teach you work ethics. So I'm watching this and they don't know it, but I'm watching all of that as we're moving. And then once they get to the point, I'm like, I'm good with you. And then, you know, I'll, I just let them go because they're, I mean, into what they're doing. And uh, it, it really, we all work together really well. We get along well and we all have that same excellence, you know, mindset in the way we work. Mm, yeah, there's a lot of gold in that. So it's, it's, you were you were looking at skills in some ways, but the primary driver was really attitude and philosophy and ethics and yes. values. And and also you kind of alluded to it there a little bit, but I guess that's really important how you actually got on with the, the person. And then the other key thing for me that came out of that was that 
that you put people into the roles where they were able to oh. shine, they were able to contribute of their best and, and where their strengths actually came to the fore. And where they, they were happy. You get somebody hmm. who's happy in what they're doing, they love their work. Oh my goodness, you know, you, you've really got a gold mine there. And they're just going to keep doing it. And they, they really, they're, 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 they're uh, probably their biggest critic. I mean, they're going to, they're going to demand more from themselves than anybody else is going to. And, and it's just really good. And I, you know, we'll have work and they'll say, I'm not sending it to you. It's not good enough yet. We're going to work on it. We've got tweaks to do. And I like that. You know, it's like they take mm. that responsibility on themselves yeah. that they're going to, they're going to make sure by the time it gets turned over that, you know, it's going to be good because we don't want to have a conveyor belt where we just put in pieces of a book on and then somebody's just kicking it to the next level. I mean, we do scrutinize every level to make sure that it's not good enough. Like it is excellent. Mm. Fantastic. Now, a lot of people, I hear a lot of people say, I'd love to write a book, but I, I don't have the time. I mean, where am I going to find the time to write a book with all the other things that I've got going on and I'm doing? So what do you say to people who who are in that position, who are kind of think, yes, we've got a book in us. Um, yes, we, we'd really like to get our message out there. Yes, we'd like to position ourselves as the person who wrote the book, but I just don't have time to do it. We've got an answer to that too, Jurgen. <laughs> what we do is we're like, great, we will do that for you. And we even got some different levels of that. Like some people, you know, they don't want to go all into the ghostwriting because they want a lot of, of control. So we help them. We're either coaching them along if they won't. And, and, and if they don't have the time, we, we, I can show you how to find time that you didn't know. That's one of the things I do. Being a mother of five kids, running a business, <laughs> yeah. you learn how to find time where there was no time. So, uh, but we can write the books for them. We, I've done that. I, I've written many, many books for other people and I love doing it. We become a creative force together. And I tell my, my, I call them authors because they're authors. I, you contribute, you get involved as much as you want. You, maybe you don't have time. That's okay. I'm good with it. You just make sure that everything's accurate. So we, we just take that up. And I love that. That's probably one of my favorite things to do is to write people's books and, and let those hmm. create juice, creative juices flow. And every time I work on a book, I learn so much, you know, cause I hmm. have to do research. And, and so to me, it's, I'm, it's just a constant learning for me that I can do. So that's our solution to it is ghostwrite it for you. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm curious when you do that, when you go stride a book for someone, how do you do it in a way that the book ends up being essentially in their voice? That's because a one very of the, one of, I'm I'm guessing that one of the things when when people write a book and it's promoted and let's say it's a business book so that you know, one of the things behind the business book is drive more business to that business or to that person. So I read the book and then I go speak with that person because I'm inspired by the book and I think that person's nothing like what how the book read. Um, there's a disconnect and immediately my, my little trust antennas are going, mm -hmm. So how do you how do you as the ghostwriter write the book that is in that person's voice so that when I'm I'm there as the reader and then talk to that person I say that's exactly what I imagined they'd be like from reading the book. Well, I record interviews and so mm -hmm. I've got their voice and I've got the way they say things and I say I get their language their what what we call the writer's voice and I and their style. And so I maintain that the best I can. If, you know, I catch them saying something, you know, uh, that's them, that's unique or the way they say it. And, you know, as a ghostwriter, part of my job is I kind of scramble up into people's minds 
Because I've got to get <laughs> how they're thinking, how they're feeling, what, you know, tell me what was going on in your head. What were you thinking? So ghost writing a book is very, to me, it's very personal as mm. I walk really close with that person because I do have to get to know them. I've got to know uh, their strengths, uh, things that they're struggling with, uh, habits, idiosyncrasies, uh, what makes them, you know, what pushes their buttons, good, bad, and how, how they react. And so it's not just for me, it's not just writing a book, but it's literally kind of, you know, becoming one with that author so that I can make sure I represent that author as close to that author as I can get. And that is mm. getting to know them as, as, as well as I can through talking and interviews and a lot of times through answering and through their answer and I mean their questions and the answering and and listening to them and listening to them and making sure I reflect that in the book. Mm, yeah, I, I think that's a great process to go through. I, I often think um, when I'm doing these conversations on the podcast and then we, we put together some notes out of that, I often get feedback from people saying, wow, you've really captured the spirit of our conversation. And I think it's, it's um, if, if you do exactly the way you said, where you pick up people's intent, people's kind of language, how they speak and so on, that, that, that can be immensely helpful in, in then writing something that is almost as if they've, they've written it. Yes, yes. And, and that is super important to me. Um, when you have a book that's out, you do want it, like you were saying, you think somebody's one way because you read their book and then you meet them and like, well, wait a minute, that's not anything like them. The book is that you, you put your name on, it's going to be there forever. And you do want it to represent you in all facets, you know, and, and the, you know, of course you want to represent the good because that's, what you want people to, you know, I'm, I'm a good attorney and this is why I'm a good salesperson. This is why I'm a good coach. And this is why. So you do want to represent that. I always think in showing people's vulnerabilities though, uh, that's where you get people bonding with them as well. Mm -hmm. And that's where people will bond with you. Like, Oh my gosh, I do the same thing. You know, Oh, I yeah. thought the same thing. Oh my gosh. That I, I would have done the same thing if it was me. And then you, you have that bond. And so when you're writing a book, if you can get the reader to bond with the character, and in this case, whether it's a business book or a memoir, once you get that reader to bond with you by showing yourself to be human and they're human, then they're going to go with you. They're going to follow you. They're going to know you. They like you. And regardless of what's going on, they trust you. And mm -hmm. so here they are. They're right there with you. So that's very important when writing the book is getting that bond between the reader and the character. And, and the character, again, whether it's a business book or if it's a novel. Yeah, that that's a really important point. I think uh, there's still this idea in business particularly and i see it a lot on blogs that i write or um even in podcasts or videos and you asked me earlier before we started recording do you edit this um afterwards if we have a big blooper and and i said well we do if there's a major thing we'll edit it but i'm i'm not going to take out me scratching my ear or my nose or us having a drink or even if we kind of um yeah some of the other things that that might happen in a natural conversation because it's it's a conversation and i hope that people listening relate to my guests and relate to me and that's i want them to take away the valuable information that you share but i also want them to say wow that was i, I really enjoyed that i really like sherry i really took a lot out of that um not just the fact part Yes, and that, that's a really good point right there. Um, I was afraid my dog would start barking. I'm like, ah, oh, I don't put that on there. But you're right. That's life. You know, people have yeah. dogs and people will, that's their right. dogs do mm. bark. I, I watch podcasts. I watch other things. And all of a sudden you hear these dogs barking in the background. I'm like, oh, well, that does happen. You know, it's mm. a human thing to happen. That's so right. I was well, uh, that. 
there's I don't know whether you saw this video clip of of the newsreader when um, the pandemic started and everybody was working from home. There was uh, one particular newsreader, and I don't know the details of who it was or what channel they worked for, but he was doing the news in his home. So he had a little home studio. He was doing the news, and he had all the professional backdrop. looked looked genuine. looked like he was in the professional studio. And then in the middle of him reading a news article, his little girl walks across, comes in to to say something to him, and then he kind of ushers her out again and continues but they broadcast that and of course that little clip went viral so everybody related to that and said oh yeah that's exactly how it is working from home yeah yeah i relate to that i relate to that that's something that would happen in my house you know yeah. or the dog jumps on the table i've been on a you know a, a professional thing and the dog jumps up on the desk and you know oh, you know people don't care they just keep going and you know it happens. So in mm. the same thing with the book, it happens, stuff happens. And if things didn't happen, Jurgen, then people wouldn't care about reading your book. I mean, That's it's right. because also, stuff happens. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. also they can't relate to it. It's kind of like you say, well, gee, this person is so perfect in every way. I can't relate to that because that's not me. I, you know, I could never do what they've achieved because I'm not perfect. Yes, yes. And that's a really good idea, um, concept is that when I used to watch Spider-Man, you know, years ago, I don't know about the recent ones, but I remember that, you know, I remember Spider-Man was really cool. He had that really cool suit. He had those those palms, you know, and the spider web would come out on demand and he could swing, you know, from building to building. But people were able to bond more to Peter Parker because he had all the flaws. He was mm. the one making all the mistakes. Love Spider-Man bonded with Peter because he was more like them. You know, mm. Spider-Man was more like, wow, I wish I could be that way. But yeah. in reality, not none of us are gonna be Spider-Man. We don't have that ability <laughs> to shoot webs out of our wrist. Yeah. Yes, that's right, yep. And you can't even imagine it, yeah. So it's different. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, I think this is a good point now to move on to the buzz, our innovation round. So they're the same five questions that I ask of every guest. And the idea, of course, is that in addition to what you've already inspired the listener with, that, that you'll provide us some answers to inspire our listener to go and do something awesome today as a result. So you ready? I am ready. <laughs> okay, let's do it. What's the number one thing anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Do not fear. Do not fear and go with your gut. And there are going to be naysayers out there who are going to say, you can't do this. This it can't be possible. But innovators to me are visionaries. And so if you see something and you feel this strong passion and draw to do it, then don't wait for permission. Don't wait for people to applaud you. Mm -hmm. You know, go with your gut and, and do it. Uh, you know, I'm not saying, you know, there's a saying that says, don't quit your day job. I'm not saying leave your day job behind and go do this mm. because especially if you have a family, that could be kind of bad. But I'm saying that, you know, get in there, go with that gut and, and believe in yourself. You know, you've got mm. the vision, you ha you're the visionary and it will, it will all come out. Maybe not all at one time, but it will come, it will slowly come to you and step out. Mm, I love it. Yeah. So feel the fear and do it anyway. Feel the um, fear and, and do it anyway. Yeah. Hmm. Great. Okay. Now, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Um, you know, for me, I'm always looking, I'm always researching, and it, it might be an article, a story, uh, a dream. You know, sometimes I'll just get these ideas dropped in me, and I, I'll, I'm like, okay, this is really cool, I think, you know? So what I do is I'll go to someone I trust and someone who knows me, which is my right-hand person. She's actually, you know, like top in my company, one of the top people in my company, but she knows me so well that when I bring my ideas to her, she shoots errors in it and she does that on purpose. And so mm. when she's doing it, I'm thinking, hmm, am I not communicating this well or, 
you know, I think she's got some valid points. And so I'll go back and I'll do some more research and then we'll come back and we'll strategize and then we'll implement. And sometimes it can feel like you're jumping off a cliff and you're just <laughs> hoping that, yeah, I let you just jump, but you're hoping that either there's going to be a safety net that catches you or when you jump, you're just going to soar and you're going to fly. Mm. Yeah, I love that. So, so testing ideas with a trusted person and, and then yes. having somebody that can kind of look at it with less, um, yeah, with less sort of connection to it from the point of view of saying, well, have you thought about this bit or what's going to happen if that goes wrong or how are you going to address this potential risk? And um, which often if we come up with this idea in the middle of the night, we very mm -hmm. rarely kind of start to think of those things, right? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. And, and so to have someone shoot holes through it is, is great. You know, it's like when I work on a book and I edit a book and I'm like, you're going to want to hear it from me instead of out there. You know, mm. let's do it while we can fix it. Let me shoot holes in it while we can fix it. So, you know, and that's how we operate. So that's that's how I come up with ideas. And they come to me, you know, um, something always prompts an idea. Mm. Wonderful. All right. Now, you must have a lot of resources you use in the work you do. Do you have a favorite resource that um, you use most often? Yes, I do. Um, well, besides my team, but when I'm working on a book, you know, I'm a, when it comes to words, I, I'm a wordsmith. I, I sometimes I agonize over every word. <laughs> and so there's a place that I don't think a lot of people know. It's called Word Hippo. Dot com. So if you're a wordsmith out there and you want to write and you want to find meanings or antonyms or synonyms or uh, what it sounds like, the word sounds like, definitions, how it can be used, uh, it's sentences, all of that, it's a site called wordhippo.com. And mm. if you put in a word, it will find the word for you and you just push the tab. What are you looking for? The definition? Are you looking for how it's used in the sentence? Are you looking for like the thesaurus, like similar words? And you can just do that and you, it just flip you through it. So it's a really good way if you're wanting to find good words to communicate. Mm, wow. That's, I didn't know that one. So I'm going to have to explore that. It's, uh, that's it's a something great that site. I think can be really helpful. Yeah. For anybody yes. writing, any, anybody. Uh, often I'd um, come across words and I think, hmm, what what um, what does that mean or how do, how is that used? You know, and, and often mm -hmm. people will use different words and it won't necessarily be in the right context. And it's you sort of look at it and say, is that just me that I don't understand that, or are they using a word out of context? So that would be a really good resource to help. It's great. Help you learn more. Mm. Yeah, it's it's a great one. Love it. Yeah. All right. Now, what's the best way to keep a client on track when you're working with them on the book? Um, I keep, I have a calendar. I'm, I'm old school. And when I got to the point I was being pulled in every different direction, I created a calendar in Excel and it's just, it's worked for me. I mean, I have it going all the way back to 2014 and I just, uh, I will watch my calendar and I, I tag certain things in, in my Excel and I use different colors and, you know, this is supposed to be to this client at this point and it's supposed to be back from this client. And I am um, sometimes, uh, a lot of times I like to, I like to lay out a schedule, like, you know, this is what we're doing, especially if it's a very tight deadline that the author's bringing to you. And we're like, so I will go backwards and I will start there. Okay. It's going to take this much time. And so I give them a schedule and I'll send them a reminder. If it's not a time sensitive, you know, I'll just send them an email if we need to get moving on something. Um, and sometimes I, you know, I understand I've been in that position. Sometimes people cannot get to something right now. Mm. It might be two weeks, but you know, life happens. Like we were talking earlier, it just flat out happens. I had one client and I didn't hear from them for 10 weeks. And I thought, where are they? Well, my goodness, this person went through so much stuff and, and they were telling me and I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm so <laughs> sorry. So, you know, things get off track and you have to, 
adjust. So I like to put some, I like to call it some padding and wiggle room for life, for life happening. So mm. we all have expectations. And if I come in under, under schedule, great. I'm a hero. But when life happens and it actually takes as long as I had told them it may, then we're all good. And everybody can go on with their life without getting upset. Mm. Mm. So you use a lot of calendar scheduling for tasks as well as, as um, touching base with clients and re sending reminders and so on. Yes, mm. yes. I will send reminders or just check in with them like, hey, is everything okay? You know, do you mm. need any, uh, help? Do you have any questions? Um, and that's if it gets like really super long. Uh, but if, it's a, if it is a time sensitive, I do have to get in there and remind them like, hey, we got this mm. going on. And they're good. They're good. Yeah. All right. And finally, the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves I would say customer service coupled with an excellent product. You know, I don't know about you, but if I'm working, if somebody is giving me a service or product and they give me great customer service, I am apt to be more loyal to them. Mm. But if they couple that with an excellent product, it got me for life. Like mm. I can't beat you. I'm not going out shopping. I'm you. I'm, I'm yours. So I think yeah. the combination of that is, is a really good, uh, it'll make you a very formidable competitor and it will make you a leader in your industry when you do things mm. in excellence. Yeah, both things, customer service and, and the product mm -hmm. or service you offer. And I think that you raise a really good point there. A lot of people f sort of focus on one or the other, focus on one at the expense of the other. Uh, so they, they might be obsessive about customer service and they don't do much with their product or service to enhance it, improve it over time or vice versa. They're so obsessed about a good product or service and they ignore customer service. So I've just had this experience or I'm having this experience where I'm trying out a new tool, um, a new platform for building community. And uh, um, as with all new software, when you first get started, there's things that you need to learn and the help documentation and things provided don't cover everything. And so I've got some questions and I've asked some questions and I've had no response to about four mm -hmm. questions in four days of a SaaS platform online, which I think is just unacceptable. And I think, wow, you know, it, the platform's got so much potential, but if that's the response I get, if I'm having an issue that I need help with getting resolved, then it's, it's not one I'm going to go with. So yeah, that combination. I'm so sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry to hear about that, but it is a turnoff, right? Mm. I mean, how apt are you to work with that company again? Yeah. You know? I mean, that's me. I mean, I'd say there are people out there who do want my business. I, I told, I had something going on with the vendor, and I was like, you know, I need. Can you help me out here? And I said, I've been with you for a while, and I said, let me remind you that. It takes more money to get a new customer than it does to keep one. Mm. And they're like, I never looked at it that way. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> they help me out here. So, yeah. um, you know, it, and it is true. It does take more money to get a new customer than to keep a, a one that you already have. Mm. And like you say, that the loyalty that is built with clients when they say, you know, this, this is a fabulous product, does everything I need yeah. and the service is exceptional, then you're not even going to look at anything else. And it doesn't matter what comes along as long as those things are met and exceed the customer's expectation, they're not going to look elsewhere. Whereas if just one little thing goes sideways, and I've had that experience a couple of times recently as well, where I've been with companies for a long time and something just went off the rails and I thought, oh, what else is out there? And all of a sudden, oh, there's actually stuff out there that's better. Uh, but I wouldn't yeah. have gone looking had yeah. not something, yeah. Yes, So yes. it's really yes. important to get both things right. Right, exactly. Yeah. 
Okay, well, thanks for getting us through the buzz, Sherry, and thanks for this conversation. It's been really great. Now, where can people find out more about the work you're doing, um, find out about the Storehouse Media Group, and maybe even get in touch and say thanks for what you've shared today? Oh, I would love for them to come and visit us at www.storehouse, S-T-O-R-E-H-O-U-S-E, mediagroup.com. And go go check us out. You can send us a form if you want to find out more information. And uh, also, we are offering a free download called How Great Leaders Write Their Book in the Story and Leave a Legacy. So if you go to writebook.sherryclark.com, and that's W-R-I-T-E-B-O-O-K dot S-H-E-R-R-I-E, C-L-A-R-K.com. You can get your free download and there's other options where you can go and, and see what it's like. What, you know, what is the, the procession of writing a book? You know, what, what do you need to do? What can you expect? Excellent. And we'll include those links in the show notes so people can click straight through and get those Great. wonderful resources. Thank you. Thank you. So, do you have some parting advice for our listener today, today, something that they can go away and turn into an action? Uh, parting advice would be, you know, um, again, if you, you're an innovator, you're a leader, an entrepreneur, uh, you know, go, go with your gut. You know, you're a visionary for a reason, and, but do not discredit counsel don't credit uh, discredit advice you know go with someone you trust uh be accountable be accountable to someone and that way it's like with Rhonda, i throw things at her and she comes back at me because there's accountability uh situation there and uh so she's you know i kind of get accountable to, accountable to her so those are things you know do get Get what you want in life and don't be afraid. And if you've got a vision to do something, go for it. Mm. Yeah, great advice. And, and of course, bring that passion and energy as you can hear in, in Shuri's voice and the excitement that she projects. Uh, bring that along into whatever you're doing. Yes. Wonderful. And, you know, people would say, don't write, they'll say, write what you know. And I'll say, write, write, write your passion. If you're going mm. to write that first book, write your passion. Great. Yeah, write your passion. I love it. All right. Finally, Sherry, who else should I get on the show and why? Oh, Macy Torrier. She is a successful 25-year-old entrepreneur, innovator, and she is rocking it. So I really think, you know, you bring her on. I think you and your audience will love her and be very interested in what she has to say. Excellent. All right. Well, we'll get an introduction to Maisie from you and reach out to her to begin that conversation. Great. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights today, Sherry. I really enjoyed our conversation, learned a lot more about your approach to the book writing process. And of course, it opens up possibilities, I think, for anybody that that is interested in writing a book, but has kind of held back because they feel they don't have the time or perhaps they don't have the knowledge to um, publish once they've written, or perhaps they are um, concerned about publishers taking a huge chunk of the royalties going forward so you've given us a whole lot of options there to look at those things in a different light so thanks so much and all the best for the future sherry and please do stay in touch oh thank you so much for having me here i really appreciate it i enjoyed it